Kate Sobrano, it's good to welcome you back. Uh, and looking fabulous, you know, like, and I can say that because last time wasn't too fabulous, was it? You know, the, the hair was all over the place, you know, it was quarantine time. Uh, You're in lockdown. I was not. I was not in a good space. It's funny, you know. Even when we were preparing for the Zoom, um, and I was in lockdown on my own, I remember thinking to myself, I should make more of an effort. But then I also thought, well, you know, with the artists, one would hope that you present as you're responding to the world around you. And I guess I kind of was losing my shit a little bit in that space. And then I was also, and also just come from a very, very, um, as you lived it as well, like a very significant time um, concerned about how we were going to be moving forward after COVID. So uh, I think that, um, yeah, you got me, you got me when I was down, but that's actually okay. Cause that's, that's art. That's music, isn't it? I, I think it's pretty fair to say that you looked how Australia felt. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, thank God I, I look how Australia feels coming out the other side. <laughs> you know, the thing that the thing that's always really triumphant about um, the human spirit is you, you, you know, when the chips are down, you've got to work your way out and you work your way through. But in this time and, um, and at this time being Australian, we're doing it all together. And so... It doesn't feel like it's anyone particularly against us. We're sort of all in it together. Um, and regardless of how it all turns out, we'll still be doing it together, going there together, going with each other. Uh, I feel like that that's been the tone of live music at the moment. Well, it was uh, remarkable too when you think about it that you weren't coming in from uh, overseas. You were uh, moving from Melbourne to Sydney and still had to go through those harrowing two weeks at that time. So quite the experience, and I would imagine the emotion that you can draw in as a songwriter, uh, having gone through an experience like that. Did you write any songs in quarantine? Yeah, I've written the two songs, the original pieces on this new album I wrote during quarantine um, to purposefully be like a bookend because the, the album is a collection of, um, of covers that of artists that I've admired throughout my career, everyone, and, and it's a, as eclectic as, you know, eclectic, should I say, as Paul Weller and McCartney and, um, you know, there's even uh, Dolly Parton and Carole King, uh, Peter Allen, many stories involved. But because it seemed so weirdly out of sync with the times to simply just go and make a covers record in COVID that was just, that whimsical I wanted to make it a little bit more weighted so I wrote Sweet Inspiration and I wrote Hold On during that time um we both released um we always sort of gave those as gifts really as a as a pre-promo for the album but um they've become really significant and they're kind of like yeah real tokens for me for the times mm. how did you go about the mechanics of making a record uh, during a lockdown period in 2020? That was very, very difficult. Uh, we had, perhaps we were a little bit more ambitious than most because we'd just come out of doing the broadcast from home um, and because we were operating off all those platforms and, and doing it in real time and we were sort of challenging each other within the house. You know, my husband, even my daughter was involved, um, Kathleen Heller and the musician, we were the only ones sort of really in, allowed in um, I guess we got a bit bold and when we invited all the musicians to come in they weren't quite as bold as us because they'd been living at home alone sort of wondering well, what next you know are we ever going to have a gig again will there be live music I, I, is this right to be recording in this time am I putting myself at risk or others at risk uh, we had a lot of people um, who were originally booked that couldn't do the recording uh for instance one his wife was about to go into hospital so he didn't want to risk the cross-contamination if we were in a place that then ended up having an outbreak you know what i mean now uh, there was another person over the other side of town where they were in a different kind of condition to the eastern suburbs and so it was very very difficult but what my husband he just he just went we are doing it we're gonna we're gonna go in we're going to do this live and if you're feeling up for it, we, we'll, we'll have you sing in real time and which resulted in, you know, 
10 plus hours a day of just the band in a circle performing in real time. And then consequently all the tracks are the full vocal that was done during that performance with the band live, which I really love that. Like it, it, you can hear the, the, the inspiration between us all and how we were responding to each other and, and waking up out of our COVID, COVID slumber, you know, uh, mm. you can hear it in the record. And um, we had to just hit and run. We did it in three days. It was done, all wrapped up, everything done. Is that how you used to record back in the early days? Well, I mean, I've done records like it, of course, with Paul Grabowski, but just, just with one other player. Um, Nine Lime Avenue was probably a little bit like that, but then again, the vocals may have been not full passes. They could have had overdubs and things, which we didn't do on this record. I think the purity of it is probably the first time I've ever really done it like that. It's, it's, it's interesting thinking of this record. Uh, you know, I think of the, the frequency in which you perceive to release a lot of new music uh, and there's been the Nigel McLean uh, collaboration the the Paul Grabowski as you said the uh, the Kilby the Senate uh, record uh, that's happened over the years but we really have to go back to what 2013 for Kensal Road to find a Kate Sobrano sub, uh, contemporary album similar to what we're getting with Sweet Inspiration. Right, right, right. I guess the other ones sort of do they I suppose they come under the heading of like an alternative record or are they, they if you if you're comparing me, I suppose the weight of having Sony behind Kensal Road um, is now resident again in this, which is great. But I think the times have changed so much in the time between having made Kensal Road and now. I mean, Dangerous Age, which is the Kilby album, um, that was created at a time where I was out of a I was out of a label, and you know that wasn't bothering me because the world has changed when it comes to relationships with music and making music. A lot of artists don't really require record labels anymore because they don't want the big advances, the financial advance, you know, they just want to just get it up, get it out. And then it, it gets sort of groundswell and starts streaming and those platforms start kicking on and um, they're able to have an independent career without a label. But for an artist like me that's had labels for most of my life, it's a very secure feeling having the support of a, of a big name. Um, certainly having a champion in this record was lovely because it, well, it clearly wasn't going to get made unless it had a champion behind it. Um, and Robert, the A&R guy that we've had on it throughout the whole process has been so, he's been so respectful towards my career and, the, and, and who I am and how many years I've been in the career and, and what it means to be recording at this time of my life. Um, mm. And then Dennis Hamlin has been, incredibly supportive you know a man famed for wearing his heart on his sleeve he um he goes with his gut really with uh, and being back on his on the roster now is is kind of lovely because it's sort of like a um I don't know it's like feeling like a Tony Bennett or something just <laughs> yeah you know, just come back home to roost when, when you age yourself, you age all of us. So be careful what you say there. Uh, I guess you've, you've never been uh, musically, you've always been, you know, moving. Uh, you know, Bear Witness, the first album with I'm Talking, uh, went into uh, You've Always Got the Blues with Wendy Matthews and that went into the Brave album and then that went into Like Now with the Sextet. You've always been jumping ship between genres, haven't you? Yeah, I think that you, if you have any desire to stay in the business, and it is a business, you know, you're in the service of the arts, then you've got a responsibility to learn more and more and more about your craft. I mean, I started singing because I was listening to Etta James and Eartha Kitt and, Nora, and Nina Simone, should I say, um, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday. Uh, and even before I'm talking, I had a jazz band, which... I opened up at the age of 15 for Vince Jones at Hamer Hall with uh, the Hoagie Cats. And we were doing um, Hoagie Carmichael tunes and Billy Strayhorn. And I was learning that whole repertoire of the jazz. And, you know, it, it comes in handy because if you ever want to pull some sort of like a, an inspiration from somewhere 
and you've been listening to people like that. They've, they've, they've been listening to a lot of classical music back in the 50s. This was like, you know, a lot of the artists from the 20s, the 30s, 40s, 50s. A lot of their reference came from early classical music. So they're very well trained. And that you just we've just sort of gotten dumber and dumber as we've gone along <laughs> and, and kind of enjoying that, enjoying it, you know. But the truth of it is, it's a cyclic thing. You must come always back around to the beginning and find the roots go and discover what the history of music is and how it affects you and also rediscover what your what your purpose what is what is your lineage in the whole scheme of things like where does Kate Sobrano's legacy fits in, fit in I mean is she going to be telling the story about where we were in COVID will she tell the story about where she was as a teenager in the suburbs growing up in the eastern suburbs of of Melbourne with songs like Passion listening to Chrissy Amphlett and, the, and Blondie and and you know what I mean? So there's like, I just feel like you have to sort of, you've got to bear witness to all the people you've been before and been around you and who's influenced you. Does that make sense? Well, and, and, and nice uh, product placement of bear witness in that answer as well. Yeah, right. Well, that, true. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking came at a time when um, the 80s were never more vivid to me. So... When I think of the 80s, you know, I'm thinking that on the radio at the time, there's everyone from Annie Lennox to uh, Elvis Costello, XTC, and early U2 and Prince and Michael Jackson. I mean, the 80s were a phenomenal um, gallery of music. And, and just like a gallery, you, you expect that there's no prejudice um, of what is being put up on a wall, you know, like an artist is an artist regardless of what you think of their work, whether you like it or not. I think we've gone through a culling system since that time where a lot gets judged and assessed incorrectly against incorrect values, mm. whereas back in the 80s it was just you just were what you is. Mm. And it was quite, it was more than enough actually. And because of it, I think maybe we were, we were even more expressive, more experimental at that time. Um, so I'm talking to me were the kind of height of my career as an artist, learning how to uh, understand how, how cool works, learning how to understand how design works, how manufacturing music digitally, because it was we were, the, we were at the forefront of the digital age. In fact, our album was the first album in this country to be born on a digital, um, in, in a digital format. So we were still, the, the guy that was producing us was going back to the SSL um, makers, telling them how it was working and what wasn't working and what needed to be fixed and how to assess problems. And, you know, so we were that, we were that test case. Yeah. I guess you, you, you've worn, uh, you know, badges from uh, jazz singer to pop star over your career. Um, the biggest chart hit would have been Bedroom Eyes. Is that, you know, obviously the uh, the fan favourite, but is this also one of your favourites? I love the music of Bedroom Eyes and because um, Nick Launay, I owe uh, most of its success to him, I think, because, well, and my mum, because my mum in the days when you'd get like a box of cassettes, if you were a popular pop star at the time, you know, people would be sending you music from all over the world and you'd literally get like an enormous box of cassettes that would arrive to you and you could go through them all, all the publishing houses from England, from Europe, from New York and pull out a cassette and you'd be listening to stuff which just goes, it, it was sort of proof that great songs, they there are not many of them. There's a small, you know, like a, a small sediment of the greatest ones and when they come, and you hear it, it, it's undeniable that they're the one. Like there's a slew of ones in the sediment that's like this much, you know, and then there's mm. this tiny little thin layer. Um, and though I didn't like the title and I very nearly didn't want to listen to it because I hated the title, when I saw the pedigree of where it came, it came from Raymond Jones. And Raymond Jones is the um, musical director for Spike Lee and he lives in, uh, well, he was living in California at the time, but he was living in Jamaica and that whole sort of electro reggae, which Rihanna and a lot of other artists have now since kind of gone into that space. But 
um, at that time, it was brand new and it was a sound that was irresistible to me. It was like, oh, that's so great. And then Nick Leone kind of brings all of that, that punch, you know, that real heavy back end pop sound um, that he's famous for, even though he only really does indie music and kind of punk music these days. But it was enough weight to go out into the field and say, hey, look at me. And it did become one of the most successful songs of the year. And it actually afforded me the opportunity to go to Europe and meet Prince and Bob Geldof and, and um, who else did I meet at the World Music Awards? Um, Grace Jones. Oh, it was incredible at the age of 18. <laughs> You've always been a magnificent uh, curator of songs, and that's uh, especially evident on uh, Sweet Inspirations with the song that you've the songs that you've chosen uh, by other artists to do. When you uh, curate a song that you're going to put on your own record, is that all based on uh, you're hearing something in that song that you're identifying with, and it's an emotion that you're getting out to your fan base through somebody else, another artist? Beautifully said. Absolutely, I couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly what I do. Oh, okay, we'll I move mean, on to fact, the next question cool. then. Yeah, that's right. You can, you, no, no, you, you've done it so. You've done this for so long. You you know the answer now. Um, I think you know you got you. If if your audience, in a sense, is kind of like you, they're people that you would get along with if you met them in a crowd, and you don't, you haven't even met them before, but you could say, "Hey, man, if I wrote you a playlist and it had, you know, Fox on the Run and it had T Rex and it had." you know, a list of all of these favourite tunes and this person's just going, yeah, 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 then you kind of know that person could almost be your best friend without ever having hung out with them, you know. Mm. When you're curating an album, it's a call out to all of your friends out there. It's a call out to say, hey, I, I kind of feel in my heart that you're going to really dig this song. Well, we, uh, we sort of wrote off 2020 for live performance. How's 2021 shaping up for you? Actually, 2021's got a really interesting vibe to it because it reminds me of what it felt like when I grew up in Doncaster and I started doing gigs around Doncaster. So Doncaster Inn, Lower Plenty Hotel, Sentimental Bloke, out through into the Croxton Park. And then you you sort of worked your way out like a kind of like this, your parameters would extend and expand because we're um, only allowed to play to a certain amount. What, it, what used to happen back in the day is you'd go out and do this concentric circle out all out into the suburbs and the regions and then all out and out into the country and then you'd come back and you'd do it all again and you'd have a bigger following this next time around and a bigger fan base and then you'd come back and you'd do it all again and then you'd land an album and it was a success and there was something so pure and honest about that. I uh, feel like we've kind of um, recalibrated some craziness that's been going on in recent times where we had such an influx of international acts and no no local artists, no Australian music was able to get a good album going um, and only, see, you know, a strong single, yes, but a strong single chasing some other international sound is not a strong cultural identity. Australian music has never been more important than it is right now. And Australian artists, because we are born of this circuit, we are essentially the ones that will be here in and during this time. You can feel the gratitude. You feel the, the audiences loving you back in that space again. Like, like I remember seeing and watching from the wings, Divinals on a cross bill with um, In Excess and Jimmy Barnes and the models and other people like that, and crowds just, they owned them. They were their Jimmy Barnes, their models, their I'm talking, you know. I think we're going to see a lot more of that coming out in the next couple of years. Kate, uh, the new album Sweet Inspiration um, is uh, out there now for all to hear. So uh, thank you for joining us here today at Noise 11 once again. Thanks, darling. Good to speak. <laughs>